The Mets take their first series against the Braves and do it in Atlanta in blowout fashion. We're breaking down the series on this Locked On crossover. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, when Jake Mastriani first reached out to me about doing a crossover, I don't think either of us expected a series finale to be 16-4 Mets. We'll be talking about all of it throughout the show today. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. With over 122 million parts to choose from to keep your ride or die alive, with all the parts you need and the prices that you want, it's easy to bring home that big win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Like I said, Jake, not the game that we expected. Uh, we thought it might be a close one in the series finale, but I think from the jump in this game, it just didn't seem like the Braves really got up for it. Okay, we, we can start it off with the first inning. You know, Brandon Nemo, Stalin, Marte, they each fly out in that inning. Um, but, excuse me, Nemo and Lindor flew out. Marte reached on a walk. There was a ground ball to Austin Riley, and it was a tough play, and it was ruled a hit. But, it was a hard shot to third that he just didn't feel cleanly, and it sort of set the tone. Then Brett Beatty gets a two-out hit. The Mets get on the board. That's one run that Allen Winnens gives up that you know it, it could have gone the other way. And then the second inning, I think it really got illuminated where you have this ball hit right at Michael Harris, and he takes kind of a lazy route to it. It's like he didn't think it was hit that hard. He doesn't really ever put the Jets on. It hits off the top of his glove, and all of a sudden the Mets score a run there. Orlando Arcia boots a ground ball. The first three runs of this game, I felt like could have gone the other way and it could have been a tie game early. Is that what you saw as well when it came to this Braves defense today? Yeah, it was just right from the jump, as you said, it just it felt like things were not going to go the Braves way today. A lot of the, their own doing, the walks from Allen Winans and then the errors that they had early on. In the first inning, I think the Riley play is the one that I'm least upset about. I mean, Adam yeah. Duvall, just a decent throw to home, I think gets Marte at the plate in that inning. But then the two errors, the the next inning as well, like you said, Michael Harris, Orlando Arcia, maybe two of the better defenders on this Braves team, uh, just make some mental mistakes there and can't make the play. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Winans pitched a good game, but you know, five innings, four earned from a guy coming up, making a spot start with this Braves offense. I would have felt pretty happy with that. And that's probably what his final line should have been. But again, it was just from the very beginning today, the Braves just didn't show up to play, and the Mets certainly did. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and you look at that that double in particular, like that one gets ruled a double, but I feel like it it's one of those weird plays. Anything in the outfield, they just don't really charge outfielders with errors, but that's one where Harris should have made that catch, and it changes the, the entire complexion of the early part of that game. The Mets did eventually break out in the third inning, where that one you can look a little more towards Winans and say, all right, like, you know, that's where he gave up the home run to DJ Stewart and some some doubles to Francisco Alvarez and Jeff McNeil. But, yeah, like I said, from the beginning, it's just the Braves were not sharp, and it, it kept going. I mean, this game ends up being 16-4. to four. Part of that is Louis Guillaume gets in at the end for some garbage time in the Mets at a grand slam. But even at 12-4, to four, there was a lot of runs today where the Braves just were not sharp in the field. No, I mean, it's certainly the case. I mean, it just one of those games as a Braves fan, I think it was Braves players too. You just flush it and forget about it as quickly as you can. It's just every little thing, you know, a lot of it self-inflicted, but, you know, also just close calls in this game always seem to go against the Braves in this one. They had some balls that were just foul in this game as well. They hit two home runs. Olsen and Riley both did uh, that they just pulled foul. It's just one of those games that you just got to forget. And again, a lot of it, is on the Braves. They just they just didn't play a great game all around. Didn't pitch well, didn't play good defense, didn't didn't come up with the big hits. I mean, they put up four runs. I mean, it's not like they didn't have an opportunity in this game, but uh they just, you know, didn't play like we're used to seeing them play and like they'll probably play for the majority of the season, but it's just one of those days where they just they didn't have it. They didn't have it and and the Mets that capitalized on it. And we saw sort of the opposite from the Mets. So Brett Beatty making a leaping catch on a line drive that ended an inning. And that was a really nice play. He made another play too, um, you know, coming down the third base line with the backhand. Great throw. Can't remember who he got out there, but a really nice play. So the Mets played solid defense. Um, Jose Quintana was good enough. Five and a third gives up three runs here. Uh, going back real quick to winning. So what did you think about what he gave the Braves in this one? 
Um, you know, again, they go to him for what I would assume is just a spot start, uh, but he at least covered some innings for them. So I guess that's the one positive you can take from the start. Yeah, it's likely going to be his only trip through the rotation. I know you and I were talking about it uh, before. It's, you know, kind of the Braves uh, kind of had to start in this game. They already called him up, couldn't bring Elder back up, but he's likely going to be the one that that gets that spot going forward with Spencer Strider out. And I thought he pitched okay. Again, I'm not going to tell you he pitched a great game, but he shouldn't have given up anything in those first two innings. And the changeup looked really good early on. And then I thought the Mets players adjusted to it that second time through the order. And you had that big inning where he gave up four runs, but uh, yeah, he did, you know, was able to stay out there, at least get through five innings, kind of help the bullpen a little bit. That was not great in the series after a fantastic series against the Diamondbacks where they didn't allow a single run. So they needed a little bit of a break. So at the very least, you want to be somewhat, uh, you know, look at this game in the Braves slide and, and look, try to be optimistic. At least the bullpen got some rest in this one as they probably needed it, even with the, the off days for all the rainouts they had. But again, he's he's probably... He's probably seventh or eighth, actually, if you look at the depth chart for the Braves starting pitching. It's just they had already called him up after the Strider injury. He's already there, so they kind of threw him out in this one. But, you know, he's somebody that if he's locating and, you know, he's able to kind of like Quintana was. You know, Quintana doesn't have overpowering stuff, but if you can locate it well, you can get some outs. And he just couldn't do that throughout the entirety of the ball game. Yeah, I think kind of going back to, to the defense of the Braves and just – what I feel overall is not necessarily taking the Mets that seriously in this one. It felt from the beginning like the, the Braves were sort of willing to let this game go, and then that's ultimately what it ends up looking like. And the reason I say that is they could have gone right to Max Freed and had him start this game. He was going to pitch on Thursday. They instead hold him out to pitch uh, against the Marlins in this upcoming series. Uh, is that are, are you valuing that extra day of rest that much in the rotation this early in the season that it makes sense to you that they went this route? You know, to have called windings up, they just wanted to make sure they got some use out of them maybe before they, they ultimately option them back down. I, I think I think it makes sense. It 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 doesn't feel good right now after you just got pummeled by your rival in the Mets, but look, the Braves have bigger goals in mind this year other than winning an early season series against the Mets. They want to get to the postseason and they want to be healthy and fresh for the postseason. They've already lost their top starter and Spencer Strider. Freed's gotten off to a little bit of a rough start. I think the Braves are playing more long term here and looking for chances to give guys extra rest. I mean, they're going to probably have to limit the innings of Chris Sale if he's able to stay healthy all season long. Max Freed's coming off the year where he was injured a lot. So I understand the reasoning for wanting to be a little bit more cautious. And I think they'll look for opportunities throughout the year to give guys extra rest like this and maybe even skip a start if they can here or there. So you don't want to hear it. You don't want to. I don't think they gave up on the game. I feel like they they could have, you know, Felt like they had a chance, but the offense was definitely going to have to do it in this one if they were going to win. And they were getting no hit by Jose Quintana through four innings. So, uh, you know, that's not going to get it done. But I understand the reasoning for push, pushing Max Freed back a day. He, you know, you would have loved to have him out there to get a chance to, to win this ball game. But I think it was more of a long term pitcher type of move to, to push Freed back a day. You know, I think it, it makes a lot of sense for the Braves and for their season. And I, I think that ultimately uh, it's the right call. But at the same time, I also think that if the Mets were in a different place as a franchise, like let's just say this was the Phillies in town. I think Max Fried's on the hill. Yeah. And so I, I think part of this is how they view the Mets right now. And rightfully so after the year the Mets had last year. But I'll tell you from a Mets perspective, this was a huge break for them. They you know got off to the rough start of the season against the Brewers. Um, and they ended up going to Cincinnati. They get a series victory. Also, excuse me, they also struggled with the Tigers. I should mention that as well. So they go on this road trip. They beat the Reds. They have this tough series against the Braves. They have the great emotional win in game one where the Braves obviously gave you know, their best effort, of course. That was the beginning of this series. And now they kind of get a little bit of an easier final game. Now they're feeling good coming home for a homestand, and maybe the Mets get off to a good start this season. So I think – from a Mets perspective, to have gone into this series against the Braves, they win two of three, and Edwin Diaz doesn't throw a pitch. That's a huge victory for them, and now they go into the weekend feeling pretty good. So uh, I think this is, again, it made sense for the Braves to not take the Mets seriously, so to speak. From a Mets perspective, though, this could be a nice little springboard. It's not to say the Mets are going to compete in the NL East this year, but I think this was a really good series victory for them. And I want to continue kind of talking about the Mets being a threat in the National League and also touch a little bit more on what the Braves rotation looks like. So we're going to get to all of that in the next segment here. 
First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. You never know what can happen in life. That is why it is always important to be prepared and make sure that your family is taken care of. This is why everyone should have life insurance, but sometimes finding the right policy is not easy and can be really time consuming and just overall overwhelming. This is where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace that will save you time and money so you can provide for your family with a financial safety net. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price, and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Policy Genius gives you unbiased advice from licensed experts that have no incentive to recommend one insurer over the other, so you can trust their guidance. Check out life or check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. Today's episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience are what brings home the winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. With eBay's guarantee fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay is guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, Jake. So going into this season, I'm curious, how are you viewing the New York Mets this year? Were you viewing them as a team that was about 500, a team that would be below that in the wildcard race? How did you view the Mets? And have you seen anything that has changed your opinion up to this point in the season? So I view the Mets as a team that can play 500. And look, in today's postseason environment, if you can play 500, you got a shot at a wild card to get into the postseason. I mean, we saw the 84 win Arizona Diamondbacks get to the World Series last year. So, I mean, again, in this landscape, I think that makes them somewhat of a, a contender. The pitching staff was going to be the big thing. When you look at that, that roster, you look at that rotation, how is that? How is that rotation going to be able to hold up? You got some reclamation projects there with Severino and Manaya. You got the veteran and and Quintana, who you know has been able to, to kind of keep hitters off balance and be able to do some good things in his first three starts. Can that continue for a whole season? I don't know, and that's a big question mark there. You know, losing Senga, I know obviously is a, a big loss. Maybe hopefully you guys get him back. I got him on a couple of fantasy teams, so uh, personally I co- hope that happens. But I, that was the big question. The the rotation. I think that lineup, as we saw in this series, I know they got off to a slow start and they kind of broke out all at the same time in this Braves series. But I think that lineup will be able to score some runs. Uh, I like Brett Beatty. He is somebody that even going back to last year, I've been re- really impressed with at the plate and in this series and in this game in particular, looks really good with the glove as well. So obviously Alvarez has some big power. So I think there's some potential in that lineup. Um, Brandon Nimmo playing Superman in game one of this series. I mean, there is there is potential in that lineup to score some runs if they stay healthy. I don't know as much about the depth of the system as you might, but the rotation was the key for me. And so far, so good. I, looking at it, the, the Mets rotation has been able to hold up. But again, can they sustain that over the course of 162? That'd be really the big question and concern for me if I were a Mets fan and, and looking to get into the postseason. I mean, I know it's going to be biased for me to say I I didn't see them as NL East contenders. I think that's going to come down to the Braves and Phillies, but would not surprise me if this Mets team, you know, won 84, 85 games. It's kind of that feeling where you have a a super team or what was supposed to be a super team last year with the Mets. Everything, you know, went wrong that could go wrong. And it's kind of like that next year, you you know, where you kind of just put that away and, and maybe the guys just kind of rally around and all that's gone, new leadership there, new voice. And maybe that changes things for them. I could see that happen and them getting a wild card spot. Uh, but that's kind of you know where I am with the Mets. Yeah, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head when it comes to the rotation. That's going to make or break them ultimately. When I look at 
the lineup and I compare them to 2022, I'm like, all right, that's a team that won 101 games that has a very similar core back here. Starling Marte looking like himself is huge for this team. We had a really good series in Atlanta here. And now you take Brett Beatty and really just a massive leap for him because last, last year he was not good. I mean, the Mets as a team had the worst third base production in baseball. Part of that was Eduardo Escobar to start, but most of that was Brett Beatty. Um, and I guess down the stretch, there were some guys like Jonathan Arauz that got a couple weeks. But regardless, Beatty was the real issue. And this year, he is playing way more confident. I referenced that line drive he caught today. Not only was it the catch, which he was on his toes, made a great play, but the way he came down, had a big smile on his face and staring right at Francisco Lindor, he's having fun out there playing good baseball. To have him, to have Marte back, to have Alvarez with this big leap, you're removing Mark Canna from that team. Um, and Eduardo Escobar from 2022. But I think this lineup, especially when J.D. Martinez comes in, it could actually be even better than the 2022 Mets. That rotation is what it's all going to come down to. And right now, I think the bullpen has plugged up a lot of, of the holes that could be there, but no one's giving them some deep starts. And that's the thing that I had to look at where I say, all right, who's going to fill in those back couple spots? You know, We saw Adrian Hauser in this series. He didn't look great. Can the Mets have a Christian Scott come up, their top pitching prospect? Can David Peterson come off of injury? Kodai Seng is going to be huge. If they get some of those guys and a Severino and a Manaya end up you know, pitching well, Quintana, we saw today, maybe the Mets can be a playoff team. Yeah, again, it it would not surprise me at all with that Mets team. There's still a lot of talent. It's still, I believe it's the highest payroll still in baseball. I know a lot of that's not there. I mean, there's a lot of talent on that team, it, it would not be crazy to think that they can get to 85, 86 wins, get into the postseason. It's one of those wild cards, and who knows what happens. You get into a short series. Braves have seen a lot of things can happen in those short series early on in the postseason. So uh, that's not crazy. The Brett Beatty one, though, I mentioned him and said, you know, I like him a lot. Uh, anytime Chipper Jones talks about hitting, I, I really pay attention and listen because he is, in my mind, one of the best minds when it comes to hitting. And I remember them playing the Mets, I want to say it was the last year, maybe – uh, the year before where he saw Beatty and talked about his swing and how good it is and how he thinks he's going to be a stud. And pretty much anytime Chipper says that, it turns out to be true. So that's certainly one guy that I've given my eye on for the Mets in that lineup. But you're right. The key comes down to the rotation, not just how good can they be? Can they stay healthy with the way things are going in Major League Baseball right now? You're seeing all the pitcher injuries. It's it's going to be attrition at that spot. The Braves have already seen it with Strider. How deep can you go? You know, you mentioned Scott, your top hitting prospect, who had a good spring. It uh, looks like he you know might get a chance at some point, but you're going to need a lot of depth in the starting rotation. Yeah, they will. They will. And I think luckily for the Mets, they got options. You know, having Jose Budo sliding in now, Tyler McGill is already here, so. They don't necessarily have the front line options, but they have depth. I think they can get through this season. My only concern is if you're not getting anybody deep into games, eventually that bullpen just, just wears down. I think the Mets have a really good bullpen. Like I, I alluded to, this series was huge for them uh, because they were able to get Edwin Diaz, Brooks Raley, and Adam Adovino, the three top relievers, just a whole week of rest essentially, which is great for them. Uh, but yeah, that's which going gonna... back to the, the Monday game, while you yeah. mentioned that, where you didn't have those guys available – and that's the game to me. This game three, whatever, throw it away. Wasn't sure what was going to happen in that one with Wine and starting. To me, it's the game one of this series that really hurts. You had a 4 nothing lead. Charlie Morton on the mound. He walks to eight and nine batters. Gives up the home run to Brandon Nimmo. But still, later in that game, the Braves had chances because the Mets didn't have their best relievers. And that last inning against Lopez, two balls that in the summer I think are probably gone. One from Ozuna for sure. Tyrone Taylor made a, a great play there. And the Braves almost were able to escape and get that one. But to your point, on the bullpen, you know, they had to, I know I saw your tweet there, just kind of exhaling at the end of that one without having those top guys available. It's a great point. You know, that, that game one was really the series. And I, I think it felt like that, but because the Braves are so good, it, it was one of those things where after the game, like, all right, well, the Braves could still come back. And at that point, there was three more games. They could easily win the final three or win the final two, as it turned out. Uh, obviously today we saw it was lopsided. That game one was really back and forth. And I think what we saw from the Mets this series that's promising is even in game two, but as well as in game one, they were battling back and they never really had that quit in them where last season, I think that Mets team would have just folded in both of those games. And who knows at that point, if the Braves won the first two games of the series, the Mets might just get swept and, and continue to fall down. So I, I, I think the Mets, especially that lineup with the youth and, and a confident you know set of young players now, because 
I think Beatty and Alvarez last year put a lot of expectation and pressure on themselves that that hurt them and made them inconsistent. I, I think you're seeing a team that's going to be gritty at least. And, and you know what? Th that's the type of team, like you said, in a short series, if they can get there, who can actually make a little bit of noise this year? I'm not expecting the Mets to win the World Series, but hey, could they be in the playoffs and win a first-round series? I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, we we saw it again last year with the Diamondbacks, what they were able to do in this wild card format. You know, you get in that wild card series and you get off to a good start, win that, take some momentum into the next round. You can carry it all the way to the World Series. And you mentioned the scrappiness of that Mets team. That's what made them so scary in 2021. I mean, they went up there, they battled. You go back to that game one against Charlie Morton. I think they had 22 foul balls against Charlie Morton. It was just it reminded me of that 2021 Mets team that was just so annoying to face because they take close pitches, they foul off a bunch of good pitches, and then they just battle, put the ball in play, and and you know usually good things happen for them that way. So it did remind me a lot more of that 2021 team, just kind of the the scrappiness, the battle uh, that they had, or sorry, the 2022 team, uh, but just the the battles that they they gave you at the plate for just everybody up and down the lineup. Now that is the the perfect transition to our final segment today because I want to talk about the rivalry. You know, how how did the Braves fans in particular view the Mets back then? Then you go through what happened last year and how it comes full circle to what this current team's going to be because these two teams are going to square off in a series now that was a two-game set that turns into a three-game set with the rain out. At the end of the year, that might not mean much to the Braves, but could mean everything to the Mets. So I want to go through the rivalry here. Um, and we'll also maybe close touching a little bit on the Braves rotation with the Strider injury just so my Mets audience can hear from a Braves perspective what's going to happen there. So we'll get to all of that in this final segment. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's right, $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So back in 2022, the Mets and the Braves actually finished with an identical record. But there was a series at the end of the season where it was Mets versus Braves in Atlanta. The Mets went into that series with the season series lead. I believe they only needed to win a single game to win the season series and to have the tiebreaker over the Braves and ultimately to have won the division. Now, either way, the Phillies probably would have ran through the Mets just like they did the Braves that year. But looking back to 2022... It felt like there was a Mets team that was getting close to the Braves that had this new ownership that was going to spend. And the Braves at that last moment really put it to the Mets. And it was a kind of defining, we're still here. We're still the best team in the division. And it felt like the Braves really celebrated that series in a big way. I don't know if that at all contributed to what happened against the Phillies, but how did you process the ending of that season and how at that time the Braves were viewing the Mets? Yeah, so I mean, at that time, it looked like it was about to be, you know, 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, Braves, Mets kind of rivalry that you were going to go into, which is how that season played out. Uh, just getting into the, the effect of that, the Braves had to scrap to win one more game in Miami to finish things off to clinch that division. They gave everything they had to come back and win that division. Part of me wishes that they hadn't, that they would have just, you know, maintained being fresh going into that postseason. Obviously, you don't want to go into that wild card series if you can avoid it, but they just seemed exhausted at the end of that season. And like I said, had to, I think it was a two, one game that they won in Miami. The only one game they won of a three there, but going into the last season, going into 2023, it still felt like that rivalry is there. I can remember, you know, in an early season series against the Mets in Atlanta, I think it was the, the series where you had Alonzo, Alonzo say something to, I think Bryce Elder or whoever it was mm -hmm. and the dugout, the Braves. I don't, I don't know if they swept that series maybe or not. And it, it felt like a, you know, a huge moment at the time in that rivalry and then, you know, because of the the shortened schedule now, you don't play each other quite as often. So I don't know that we saw you guys much till later in the year. And then you had, you know, the Scherzer sell off and, uh, and Verlander and all of that. And it just it felt like it wasn't quite there towards the end of the season. But 
it's crazy to say with what the Phillies have done to the Braves the last two postseasons, you would think that's their biggest rival. I still consider the Mets to be the rival. And maybe that is just the, the late 90s, early 2000s part of me and watching those two guys and or watching those two teams and the rivalry that it does. But I saw something on Twitter, I think today even, where somebody ran into Vaughn Grissom in a Mets hat and he said he didn't want to talk to him because he was a Mets fan. And the guy's like, you don't even play in the NL East anymore. And he said it's deeper than that. So I think that tells you right there, just from a Braves perspective, they still consider the Mets to be their top rival. Yeah, it's. I think it's really those three teams in this division, the, the Phillies, Braves, and Mets, where the hate is on a different level. Maybe there was a point in time where you know the, the Max Scherzer, Juan Soto, Nationals, where they were also at, as much of that NL East rivalry as those other three teams. But you know, th- this goes back longer. You know, I know for both of us, I'm not sure quite how old you are. I'm 28, so I know going back to like the early uh, 2000s, the Piazza years was my first kind of Mets team, and then even. The, the David Wright, uh, Jose Reyes, Carlos Beltran Mets versus the Jimmy Rollins, Chase Utley, Ryan Howard Phillies. You know, that went back and forth. And that was one time where it was Mets Phillies a little bit more. But it's always been those three teams that, that have really defined NL East baseball. And it is interesting for me to hear that, that to you know, for a Braves fan, the Mets are still the chief rival. And going back also to that series you referenced last year, I did pull it up. The, the Braves took the first two of that series um, against the Mets. And at the time, the Mets were 15 and 11 going into the series, and then they cratered in May. So that is certainly, uh, um, you know, about the time where it started to go sideways. And and now I guess you go into this season, and and the question is, what version of the Mets are we going to see this year? Are we going to see more of last year? Is that going to come up? Or is this team going to be something closer to 2022? Maybe a step below that. But if it gets down to September, right, and there's a three-game series – to, to, it's the second to last series for both of these teams. They've now added a third game to it because of the rain out that, that took place on Wednesday. If the Mets are sitting a, a game up in the wild card, how important are the Braves going to take that series? Let's say they have the division sewn up, but they have a chance to knock the Mets out of the playoffs. They're going to be taking that, that series pretty seriously, I'd imagine. Yeah, I would imagine so. Look, it's got a similar situation they had last year with the Cubs. C- Cubs came in there fighting for that last uh, wild card spot, too. And I want to say the Braves went in there. I know they at least won the series, may have swept it, too. Um, so, I mean, the Braves – and it's it's part of the thing, too, where, yes, you – clinch. I'm not going to say the Braves have clinched the division at that point, but for the case last year, they had clinched you know, mid-September. You still want to keep trying to play that competitive baseball. And so that would be a series like the Cubs one was last year where you're playing a team that's still fighting for something, even though you already – accomplished everything that you want to and so maybe you know it would be an opportunity if the Braves had the big lead to still you know have some of that fight and play somebody who again is really trying to accomplish something and get that you know competitive playoff energy going that's obviously really hard for them to replicate with five days off that they've had the last two years how much since you mentioned it how much uh do you think that waves on the Braves as we get towards that point in the season right like let's just say uh, the Phillies have a great year, or even the Mets, whoever it is. But if, if the Braves are coming down the stretch, would they really not care about the division to, because they're so afraid of the days off? Or is that that days off thing something that they just got to try to overcome and, and try to find another way to prepare for the postseason? Yeah, Brian Snicker and others have said, look, they're going to try to win the division. They're going to have to figure out you know, this whole off day thing and how to get the offense ramped back up. I don't know the solution. I don't know that anybody does. I mean, you look at the Braves and Dodgers last year, just both two of the best offenses – all year and can't score in that first round. So, but I mean, they're not going to throw the division just to go to the wild card round where you got just as much of a chance to have a bad couple of games and be knocked out before you even get to the NLDS. So they're going to go for it and go for those off days. They just kind of figure out how to get the offense going back again. And I think that actually also makes the current rotation situation very interesting. I want to close there with you because uh, you would have thought that Spencer Strider would be starting game one of a, a potential wild card round or, or, you know, a divisional series round, whatever it would have been. Uh, How are, are you viewing this rotation now? I mean, I know Strider, there hasn't been a decision made, but uh, do you think there is a need still now? Like let's say Strider doesn't come back. Are the Braves a team that has to make a move at the deadline to get another frontline starter? Or do they have enough in house when it comes to frontline guys to make a run when they get to October? I think they'll be fine in the season, but in October, do they need one more? 
I mean, you'd love to have one more for sure. I, I still feel pretty confident in a, a free Chris Sale, Charlie Morton, if they're all pitching like they're capable. I think that's still good enough to win in the postseason. Look, they won it with a lot less in 2021. I mean, they were they were either having Dylan Lee start a game as an opener in the World Series. It's just uh, this it's it's really comes down to the offense. And you look at last year's postseason, it wasn't the pitching, it was the offense. And how do you get them going? And that's what the key to this whole Braves team is, but you got a window here to win a World Series. If there's somebody available at the deadline and you have that need, because there's no replacing Spencer Strider, but if you can get that front line arm at the road at the deadline, I think the Braves have to do it. You can't let it, you can't go into another postseason limping in there with two of your starters injured like they have the last two years. I think you got to have a healthy rotation, set yourself up as best you can going into the postseason with as many good arms as possible. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how the Braves play it. Uh, we'll see how the Mets hang in in this division and just in the National League playoff race in general. It'll be exciting to watch every time these two teams match up. It's always a series that you circle. You want to see the two division rivals square up, and we'll be back, I'm sure, for future crossovers throughout this season to talk about all the latest in the National League East. Jake, appreciate your time. Uh, why don't you tell everyone where they can find your work? Yeah, you can obviously find me on uh, social media or X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, at Shortstop Ball. Uh, host the Lockdown Braves podcast. Get it on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, just like you can Lockdown Mets. Absolutely. You can find me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for tuning in today. Now, for your next watch, head over to Locked On Sports Today, the first ever 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube that covers everything in the world of sports with our local experts from each team and our league wide experts from each league. You can find Locked On Sports Today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.